Hello and welcome to the Game Theory Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Vecini. We're presented by The Athletic. Today on the show, it was trade deadline day. I don't know if you guys heard, but something crazy happened that we've been waiting for for somewhere between 6 and 12 months, depending on if you're a Philadelphia 76ers fan and can see this coming from a mile away. Lucky enough, I have a good one in my life. And Mike Levin, writer of many TV shows, uh, how many episodes do you have story credits on? Probably a few oh, now. Uh, I have no idea. I actually have no no idea the answer to that question. I had plenty. Enough. Plenty. Enough of them. One of the funniest people I know, consistently one of the funniest people on the internet, and host of the Rights to Ricky Sanchez podcast. Mike, how you doing, man? Uh, Sam, I'm, I'm great. It is. <laughs> I did think that I thought that this was going to happen. You hear some whispers, you hear positivity. I'm gen- generally a pretty optimistic. I'm either very optimistic or very pessimistic, very rarely in the middle. Um, and it just seemed like this was going to happen. It just seemed like both the Sixers and the Nets, even if the Nets had to be kind of dragged to this place, <laughs> it seemed like there were too many incentives to just get a deal done now rather than deal with the baggage of whatever happens in the next four months before doing it in the summer. So I did think it was going to happen, but seeing James Harden has been traded to the Sixers is a different kind of feeling. And it is, uh, it's wild. And seeing him in a, in a Jersey and seeing him suit up will be, will be another special type thing. But right now it's just, it just feels really good. I'm happy about it. It's funny, and I'll just kind of lay out the way this podcast is going to go. I'm going to talk to Mike for 15, 20 more minutes. And then I've already recorded with Mo Dekeel breaking down the rest of the NBA trade deadline. We talked a little bit about Simmons and Harden at the top, and then we went through all of the rest of the deals. So we're going to talk like that. And let's just lay out the trade for everyone, just so they know in case they've been living under a rock. It is Ben Simmons, Seth Curry. Andre Drummond, two first round picks for James Harden and Paul Millsap. And an interesting deal. I woke up like right as it happened, apparently. And I was not super surprised. And I think that I generally tend to agree with you and your overarching theory on basketball, which is also one of my overarching theories on basketball. The great players tend to figure it out. Great players just tend to be great. They work around one another. They make it happen, right? And James Harden's a great player. I also think that's Daryl Morey's strategy. And I think that at the end of the day, what we can say most about this trade is that Daryl Morey was right to hold on to Ben Simmons for as long as he did. It was the national nightmare of the NBA for some people, just melting down a about this constantly, wondering why Daryl Morey hasn't pulled the trigger. Why hasn't he traded Ben Simmons yet? And I think it's impossible to say anything other than you can have questions about the deal. I have questions about the deal, to be honest. I have questions about how Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid fit, even though I do tend to believe that great players figure it out. I think it's undeniable that Daryl Morey figured out what he wanted to do from the jump, and he completed his task. He said he wanted to get a superstar for Ben Simmons. He strongly believes that superstars and minimum players are the two greatest marginal inefficiencies in the NBA. He's always felt that way. That's been his overarching team building strategy for years now. And he did it. He acquired Ben, he traded Ben Simmons and acquired another superstar in James Harden. It's got to feel pretty good if you're a Philadelphia 76ers fan that you've been hearing from Daryl Morey. He's going to do this for years upon years upon years. And he finally did it. It's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, you look at it like it's been obviously a very weird seven months, right? Like he been melted down in the Hawk series and then it immediately became a conversation piece around the league uh, and in the media and everything. And so it became like, all right, he's he's not going to be here. He doesn't want to be here anymore. A trade is going to happen. A trade is going to happen. And then it keeps going on and on and on. And when he wasn't traded before the season, it was like, okay, I guess we're just living with this until the deadline. And once once it happened before the season, he didn't get what he wanted. Daryl didn't get what he wanted in the deal. 
it became like, well, why wouldn't he just wait as long as humanly possible to make sure that the the best offer is coming in? And I think if the Sixers were a 500 team or under 500, which was certainly possible if Embiid wasn't playing as well as he's played and Tyrese Maxey hadn't taken the leap that he took. So they could have definitely been like a couple games under 500. They might have just said, let's just trade Ben for picks and we'll re- regroup in the offseason. But once it's, it was pretty clear that this team is good enough that they are kind of one, I would say, big piece away. They weren't one piece away like a you know Dorian Finney-Smith away. They're one James Harden away. That they yeah. can that that it does it does make sense to be like, well, we have Ben. He's not getting worse. His value is not getting lower. It's either you're a team that likes Ben and think you can work him in, or you're a team that doesn't. Um, and so it's like, well, let's see if this is the best deal. And so for a while, it was like, well, does Indiana have the best deal? Does Sacramento have the best deal? Mi- Minnesota is really trying to push for like, do you want D'Angelo Russell or whatever? And I was like, one of those deals is always going to be around if you have to take it, but. Daryl waited long enough to be like, I believe that something else will come about. For a while, it looked like it was Harden. It could have been Beal. It might have been Beal if Beal didn't have season-ending surgery. And then it became like Harden's available. And he's, I think, the best player out of those guys, even if he's towards the end of his prime and has now forced his way out of two places. But he's just good enough to where, and especially has the relationship with Daryl enough to where you just go like, yeah, this is... This is the trade. This is the trade we've been talking about for a long time. Um, and to trade one of the crown jewel pieces of the process for a guy as good as James Harden, who's going to be a Hall of Famer, who was an MVP player very recently, who's playing a little like the worst basketball of his career, but only because his whole career has been so excellent. Um, yeah. And he's the kind of guy that, as we've seen, is, you know, I talked about on the Ricky today, but like when he's not engaged, his game slips quite a bit. <laughs> but when he is engaged, he's one of, still one of the best players in the league. So it, this is just like, it's got to feel incredibly validating for Daryl. It's definitely incredibly validating for the Sixers fans who like suffered through this season and the whole Ben charade and, uh, and to get him and think like, you know, he's already picked up his option. He's here for at least a couple of years. They're probably going to give him a, a heck of a lot of money. But like the championship window was wide open. We have Harden and Embiid, two of the best players in the league. This, this rules, man. It's, it's just very cool. Yeah, like, were you more excited for this or when they got Jimmy Butler? I would think this, especially because I lo- I loved Covington, and so trading Covington was tough. Yeah. He's obviously had, like, a pretty just fine career since then, and, and obviously Dario was a, was another process crown jewel, both of those guys. Um, and Jimmy was also, at that point in Jimmy's career, what, he wasn't, you know, he's, he, I think he took a step forward in Philly, and then he took an, even a bigger step forward in Miami. Um, Harden, I think, is a, at a higher level of player than Jimmy was at that time. Um, although now they might be pretty close. Um, and and this trade, I think, is just like because Ben was obviously Ben was here as far as like an asset goes, but he wasn't here. Like, and we were talking about possibly waiting for the trade to happen. Daryl said on the radio four years, and the <laughs> the idea that we would just sit around for four years was was daunting and. Uh, upsetting but i understood it but to to if you basically assume if you take ben out of the equation because he wasn't going to play for them ever again um i never believed that some people thought that they could like kumbaya together i thought that was uh after this many months pretty pretty unhinged to to think um it's basically seth curry who they got for an expiring josh richardson andre Drummond, who they got at the minimum and who's a backup center he's fine and uh, and two picks, one of which will definitely be in the late twenties, and one is in five six years from now. So it's like it's a really good trade. It's a really good trade, and you have to trade something to get a caliber of James Harden. You're not going to get him for free, but for for what it is, you got to feel really really good about the team the Sixers have and they're they're building towards. And then you know things that will change in the summer when Daryl has more time to to really curate the kinds of players he would like around those few guys. Yeah, I think that the way you put it in terms of they're getting literally nothing from Ben Simmons right now, mm-hmm. literally nothing. And they are a clear top five team in the Eastern Conference. You are now going from essentially Seth Curry to James Harden. Mm-hmm. And that is an insane difference. Like regardless of what you think about James Harden and Mo and I will go into the questions that we have about this. We talked about it for a while, 
but like it, it's an impossibly strong upgrade. Like yeah. I, I worry about the way that they match up with teams in the playoffs. Like I wonder a little bit about like a Boston series, right? Where Boston now is Derek white and Marcus smart that they can throw on uh, James Harden. And then you're going to have to play drop coverage in any series when you have Joel Embiid. And I worry about teams just like switching or, you know, screening off ball or screening on ball until they get the guy that they want on Harden and then forcing a drop coverage situation where Harden has to fight over the top. Right. Like I'd be worried about that and what that looks like against Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. But you know what? Like th- th- those are, those are big picture, like, problems there i guess those are smaller picture problems like the big picture problems are fixed like you have two stars you can manage the roster for next year after that it might suck for this year you can figure it out the rest of the way like you actually have an enormous contract to make it work with tobias harris you have like matisse thibel and tyrese Maxey. you have assets to where you can actually go get the third guy that makes it work this summer if you need to so in all, like, I think it's a really smart trade for Philadelphia. Like, they had to do it. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, what is just your take on the Ben Simmons era at this point? I feel like it's such a complicated, weird conversation to have now if you're a Philadelphia fan. Yeah, it is weird. I'll just add to your last point, and I agree with those defensive concerns, but, like, Seth, I think, is maybe a worse defender than James Harden. He's yeah. smaller, weaker worst rebounder six or horrendous rebounding team um Definitely. at least harden if you take him in the post he'll you know use his mass to to keep you from going anywhere um yeah. but yeah I, I agree with the concerns generally um ben yeah it's weird i mean it's weird it's all been weird the sixers since the andrew bynum trade have been marked as the strangest franchise in sports i would say just the sheer number of <laughs> incredibly odd things that we could run through that I have cataloged in my brain somewhere, but uh, just specifically for Ben. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was very invested on the, on thinking that the Ben and Joel era could, could get you to a championship. Obviously it didn't, obviously it didn't get to the conference finals, the Kawhi shot, um, the Atlanta meltdown, some injuries here and there. Um, it, I think a lot of it is the, byproduct of some things like the Sixers never getting a proper stretch five for when Embiid sits um, outside of Al Horford, who costs way too much money to be, to pay your backup center that much Um, as well as like uh, never having like a real point guard until Maxi, at which point it was kind of too late uh, to salvage that, to like expect him to jump into that role so quickly because they spent all these assets on Fultz being the guy, and then obviously that didn't uh, quite happen as we uh, expected or wanted it to. Um, so I think there's a lot of, you can make a lot of excuses, but it, it really boils down to like, you look at how much Joel has grown from year to year to year, um, since probably the bubble season, especially to now. And even last season, he was a second you know, runner up for MVP, and he's gotten so much better this season than last season really expanded his game in a a number of ways passing um is the obvious one because he was bad at it before and now he's like pretty good at it but also just like agile finishes you know knowing when to draw fouls just he feels like if if a center can be like chris paul like he feels like he's the center version of chris paul right now just kind of locked in um as well as being the anchor of a defense to where you can put whichever wings, whichever slow doughy wings the Sixers have out there and be like, be a competent defense and he'll be, and and Embiid can make it work. Whereas Ben just never got better. Like he just didn't get better at enough things is pretty much what it is. Like maybe it's because he doesn't, you know, put himself out of his comfort zone. There's a ton of like armchair psychology about what, what is going through his mind. He's not a particularly vulnerable person, uh, front facing, so we don't know, but um, he just didn't get better enough. He didn't get better enough in the half court. He he didn't get better enough, um, obviously, as a shooter, obviously, at the foul line. He never really improved it, like even drawing contact or really utilizing himself as an incredible cutter or like fulcrum of the offense from like the elbow or something. There was just no place on the court 
on, in the half court that you could put him where he was extremely helpful. There just wasn't, especially in the playoffs. There just wasn't a place where you could put him. That being said, one of the best defensive players in the league, probably the most versatile defensive player in the league, incredibly you know, impossible to stop in transition. Um, him just being on the court creates open threes for guys. So it, it, it goes to show how good he is despite not really improving in these areas that you traditionally expect improvement from as a basketball player. He didn't do it. Um, a bunch of other things didn't go into it. And then uh, I think he, you know, on a personal level, on a, a, a co-worker level, I think he overreacted to them almost trading him for Harden earlier. And then a couple stray Doc and Joel comments that weren't that bad after the Game 7 loss in the Hawks when they were all very shell-shocked that they would lose a game to an inferior opponent. Um not not exclusively because of Ben, but largely because of him. He was the biggest issue in that series for sure. And so I think he overreacted. I think he retreated and then they just doubled down and um, assumed that the, the trade would happen quickly and it didn't, but now it's over. So we have James Harden and I, I, I wish him well. I think he's going to be pretty great in Brooklyn if, if he do, starts doing those things that they need him to do and screen and roll and operate out of the dunker spot and, all those kinds of things. It'll, it'll definitely be a better fit in Brooklyn than it was in Philly. Man, I, I remember there was like a stretch in his last year on his rookie contract where they started using him as a like role man. And it was just like unbelievable. Like he was so good at it just from the jump. And you just want him to be that. But like part of it is too, like it doesn't seem like he has interest in that. Like he's made so many public comments over the years about wanting to be a point guard and wanting to be this and wanting to be that. And sometimes you're not that guy. Like if you need to do one of two things, you need to either improve as a scorer and shooter for yourself, or you need to fall back into being more of the secondary guy. There's not, it's an either, or it's not a, you can do both things. Like you need to either improve or you need to fall back. And he never really improved. And because of that, he might be perfect for this Brooklyn team because of it, because Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant are going to take all the shots. He should have all the open space in the world to create shots on the second side of the court. Like I am so excited for whenever we eventually get lineups with like Kyrie and Kevin Durant and Joe Harris and Ben Simmons. And then, uh, you know, throw whatever guard out there and throw whatever floor space or you want out there. Seth Curry's there now, obviously you can use him in this situation, right? Like, I don't care if those teams are going to give up 150 points like per game. I just want to watch them play offense because they're going to be really fun to watch play offense. So I I don't know. I I don't know where Ben goes. Like I think Ben Simmons and Zion Williamson right now are the two biggest questions in the NBA point play. Zion's probably number one because where the fuck is Zion Williamson? Like you listened to David Griffin talk today and he was literally like, well, anecdotally things seem to be going great. Like, I, I can't tell you, but anecdotally things seem to be fine. And it's just like, wait, you're like running the team. How, how are you going off of anecdotal information at this point? Like, how is that a thing? So that's the number one question. But Ben Simmons, I genuinely believe, entered the NBA as one of the, I don't know, five most talented teenagers to enter the league in the last like decade, maybe even two decades, honestly, he's that gifted. He's six foot 10. He's an incredible athlete and he can do the way he thinks about basketball. So genuinely special and creative that he could do anything and be anything that he would want to be on the court. If he would put time into it and like really genuinely decide he wants to be great. It, I don't know. It's just a bummer. Like it's a bummer the way it's worked out. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, there's a million things that, you know, sliding doors moments that, things could have changed and everything. But I will say the the main reason that Ben wasn't excellent as a role man, I think, is because you also want Embiid in those spots. You you don't want Ben you want you want Embiid posting up. You want Embiid facing up. You don't want Ben rolling into that spot. And so often, especially you saw it more in the Horford season, but so often it'd be like the paint is incredibly clogged with all those guys. I think Tobias being like also wanting to do some like, you know, JV post upping, posting up of like, you know, just like jab steps and, and fadeaways and stuff like that, which obviously they're trying to, you know, beat out of him. 
but the the personnel around them wasn't helping. But I also think, you know, if Ben is not improving as a shooter, then he has to be a role man. And if he's a role man, then you want Embiid out of the way. And Embiid can space the floor. He's a good, th- good three-point shooter. But you also want him in there getting fouled. So where is Ben while that happens? And it's as much as that feels a little bit reductive to to think about basketball that way, like it, it kind of is that simple these days. Like you want spacing so that your better players can go to can operate. And if you're not either the one with the ball or the one creating like creating some space with the ball on picks, then where where are you? Like you better be out of the way. And and when Ben's out of the way, he's just you know out of the play. And I didn't mean for that to run. That sounded pretty talk radio of me to you're not out of the way you're out of the play like i don't who's doing that what am i doing that for <laughs> oh my god uh final thoughts i want to get you out of here in 20 minutes so you know do you have any any strong takes here as we uh as we close up um i mean i i just think this you know there's there are some people and maybe i don't know why i'm focusing on that but there's some people being like they traded too much for harden or something or like he's you know he's clearly towards the tail end of his prime or out of shape or doesn't give a crap or whatever it is. But like you think about the process, you think about where, where we come from. Like there's just not that many opportunities to land a player of this caliber and to pair him with Joel Embiid, who at this point is arguably the best player in the NBA when you consider both ends of the court and Harden fills a, a direct need because the Sixers are not only you know, the Ben Simmons hole in their lineup left them with a lot of weaknesses. Not that Ben would have solved all of them, but it left them with a lot of weaknesses. Rebounding is one of them. Speed and athleticism is one of them. But it's also like they have very limited ball handling. When Maxie's not on the court, there's like no one to do anything. And now all of a sudden we get James Harden in there for like automatic offense. When Embiid's not in there, put any role man in there. I think I think Paul Millsap's going to be a nice fit as a pick and pop guy. Um if not him, sometimes, you know, Paul Reed or Charles Bassey just being a screen and roll big rim running type of thing. I, I just think like they're James Harden is <laughs> James Harden. What are we doing? He's just like one of the best players in the league and one of the best scorers of all time. And while we're while they're doing like so many long, slow dribble handoffs to get the ball to Tobias twenty feet from the basket so they can turn and look, it's all of a sudden it's like, well, the ball's in James Harden's hands when it needs to be. And and that's going to be good. Um, and Harden's never played with a, a big like Embiid. And I think that, that that is exciting. I think, I hope that both players make each other better. You never know how, how guys are going to gel and, and chemistry, but ever, whatever. But I think the Sixers in a wide open playoff field. I think the Suns are the best team in the league right now. But I think if the Sixers come together, they have the talent to beat anybody. And that's that's very cool. It wasn't looking that way for, for a a long while this season and in the last off season. So the fact that Daryl could, could cobble this together is, is extremely impressive. And if it doesn't happen this year, cause it's hard to bring it all together in one in like half a season, then, then, then you regroup and go in, go in for next season because you have limited years of James Harden's athletic prime still and beats playing at this high of a level. They, they should win a championship. This team should win a championship in the next like two or three years. So that would make me feel good. Yeah. And that would be good for all these guys. (laughs) I think that's the hope. And look, I mean, we have a little bit of evidence of James Harden playing with a big, like he played with Dwight Howard in Houston and they won 52 and 56 games in the first two years of that. It fell apart entirely in the third year. And maybe that's a risk, but if you get two great years out of this, where it's 52 and 56 wins and you make an Eastern conference finals and you're in the Eastern Conference Finals. You're in the Final Four, and you have a real shot to make the title, like or win the title. I mean, that's that's all you can ask for. I think that's it, as long as you get two great years out of this window, where you have a real shot to win it. It's all you can do. Uh, yeah, and I, Mike, and I would say that I would say that just the last thing is is Tyrese Maxey has really improved so much from year one to year two, and over the course of year one, on his own, and then just keeps growing quickly seems to just like love getting better and love to learn and love to do whatever. And his, his step back jumper is improving. His catch and shoot jumper is, is a work in progress. He can get to the rim against anybody. He's got, a, he's got a like killer floater. He's learning how to draw fouls and beat and Harden will now draw the most fouls in the league. It's going to be a f- five hour Sixers games. 
so set your DVRs extra long. But I think, you know, even as Harden starts to decline a little bit, the hope is that Embiid will take some of the load off so it doesn't have to be like just Harden ball. And for Maxi, he can continue to grow into his prime as Harden takes a step back and you can have whatever, whatever sort of like, not like a, you know, your shot, my shot type of Devin Booker, Chris Paul thing. But I think that there is some level of like an easing out of James Harden for when, you know, just to save him because he's had, you know, so many miles on his legs as Maxi takes more leaps forward because there's just no telling how good this kid can be because he's, he's been great. Like he's been such a yeah. genuine joy to watch as he continues to figure out how to succeed at the NBA level. Yeah. It was crazy to me that a kid that driven because he's always been just like an elite level character kid. Uh, mm-hmm. It was crazy to me that that kid fell in the twenties. Like it made yeah. no sense to me at the time. And the Sixers got really lucky. Um, they got Mike really, really lucky. <laughs> Shout out Mike Muscala. Shout out Mike Muscala. I'll never forget him. Mike, tell the people where they can find you. Um, if you uh, want to I'm on I'm on Twitter at Michael underscore Levin. I'm a writer on the show Young Rock, which you can watch on Hulu and Peacock and NBC.com coming back for season two in March. Little little guy named Dwayne Johnson is the uh, is the star of that. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and the rights Ricky Sanchez, which we've been doing for eight years. Um, been some weird, been some weird milestones in there, but, uh, would love to cap it off with a championship at some point. Yeah. Does the podcast end? Like if you win a championship, I don't know. I don't know. I think we, I think there was some, there's definitely some, like, I think if Maury didn't come, then it would have been pretty bleak, but because Maury is a hinky guy, then it was like, okay, that was a little bit wind in our sails. And then the Ben stuff, I think like wore it out for us. And so there's always, there's always the occasional like what are we doing but it it feels like as long as Embiid is there and they're still like searching for their championship it feels like i am drawn to continue doing this i i feel too guilty oh. not to i'm too committed to the process and whatever the hell else we've endured for this long Oh my God. That's been Mike Levin. Uh, one of just the best basketball follows, uh, on the internet, in my opinion, go listen to the Ricky. Uh, as soon as we come back, you're going to have me and Mo DeKeel talking about all of the rest of the trades that happened today. Thanks, Mike. All right. We are here with Mo DeKeel. Mo. What's going on, man? It's good to catch up. I'm glad that you're here. I was told I was told today that on the Athletics NBA trade deadline show that was happening live, you guys should all go check it out on YouTube, uh, the Athletic NBA show, at wherever it's going to go up. It'll go up in a variety of places. I was told Mo DeKeel is on fire. I, you need to have Mo on the show today. So I shot you a DM and you were like, let's do it. I'm in. Yeah, it's funny. Like when people say that type of stuff, I just keep talking, and then eventually, some <laughs> at some point, a coherent point was is somewhere in there. Most of the time, there are times where it's like, oh wow, even I got lost. <laughs> oh yeah, I got, I got a little lost in the sauce on that one. I'm just I'm just talking. I'm just rolling. It's funny. My wife and I were having a conversation about that um, same thing last night, where you get in her case, like in a meeting, and you just kind of keep talking until you end up making a point. I feel like I do it all the time on podcasts, where I just kind of keep keep talking and eventually my point comes out i think that that's the key you just got that's what you hope you just and eventually yeah you just hope it comes up like it just sort of blossoms in the in the uh, uh storyline but oh. <laughs> it's amazing okay so i want to talk to you about all the trades that happened today my original plan was to not really talk about the simmons harden stuff with you because we just talked about it at the top of the show with mike levin but you have some you have some takes, and I think they're a good counterweight to Mike's takes. And I, I haven't recorded with Mike yet, so I'm assuming they're a good counterweight to Mike's <laughs> takes, to be yeah, honest. It'd be really awkward if it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've been on record on this podcast. People who have listened to the show, I think, will know that I have my I don't want to say doubts, like I, I just have some questions about the way that Joel Embiid and James Harden fit together. It's not that I think that they like definitely won't work, but they 
do tend to operate in drastically different ways on offense. And I think that, you know, the way that James Harden operates as a dominant pick and roll player, uh, in addition to the way Joel Embiid plays, which is like as a dominant post-up guy, it's a little bit oily and watery uh, in today's modern NBA. And I know that you kind of feel similarly in that you have some concerns, not that you're saying it's going to be like a disaster, but maybe you do think that I, uh, yeah, I think that you similarly are just, you know, kind of a little bit skeptical of this. I'm probably more than a little bit skeptical to be honest with you, but before we get into that stuff, I don't know if you realize literally what just happened. So the NBA is also having their all-star draft right now as we speak. And the, there are two people there were two people left on the board and it was kevin durant's pick and it was james harden and rudy gobert and you could just see you could just see the the dilemma in his head (laughs) as to what do i do (laughs) under it's it's incredible it is absolutely incredible that the nba puts the all-star draft on the same day as the trade deadline. And like <laughs> whoever came up with that is either a genius or just like logistically forgot planning. But like it's, it's such unbelievable, a unbelievable then, flex on the NBA's part. And then he has to make that decision. And you can kind of just see what it ended up happening. You just kind of see him and LeBron both are like, oh boy. <laughs> It'd be amazing if you just went pass <laughs> you could take them both we'll play down number <laughs> we'll play with lebron guys. you guys you guys deal with 14 we'll take 11 or whatever yeah, right. <laughs> right like that was so i'm sorry that just that literally was happening as you were introing me and i was dying and i was like yo oh i, I kind of have to bring this up <laughs> It's unbelievable. The the NBA is like the best place on planet earth. It's like uh, my lead to the story I'm writing is about, you know, I'm writing about the fit of James Harden and Joel Embiid. I'm writing about the fit of Ben Simmons in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And it's literally just like, you know, putting aside the big drama show to quote Gennady Golovkin of, you know, the NBA and the NBA sideshow of it all. Uh, but you can't do that. Like the, this league's great. The big drama show is the show. This league's great. I don't think people understand. And we haven't. And the basketball is amazing. Like we it's actually so have had really good basketball. But it's like it's, you get the sideshow and this. This is why I love the NBA. It just is just and it's unintentional comedy to you know a large degree. It's just like oh wow, my god, I love this league. But let's it's get. So good. Let, Let's, let's go real. Let's talk about let's talk about James Harden and Joel Embiid. What, tell me what you think of this fit with Harden in Philadelphia. So, for context, the full trade is it is James Harden going to Philadelphia uh, for Ben, or along with Paul Millsap, I should say, along or for Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, uh, Andre Drummond, and two first round picks. When let's just go there. What did you think of this fit? Uh, first thing, I, I mean, first thing I uh, thought of the trade was like, wow, that's a slam dunk for the Nets. They got a lot out of that. And 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 that's a big mm-hmm. win for them. But in the Sixers side of it, and I've been thinking about this really since last week when it's the rumors really started to kind of percolate, like, yo, this yeah. can really happen. Um, and, and I was like, okay, I have problems on both ends of the court for these guys in that pairing and everybody's kind of going nuts. And I want to start on the offensive end. Everybody's going nuts about how, wow, you have Joel Embiid MVP favorite. And then you have uh, James Harden, who's going to be, you know, just sort of the, the, one of the best pick and roll players ever. And they're not wrong, but it doesn't mean it works well together with the two of them. James Harden is at his best in the pick and roll when it's a rim runner. When it's a guy that when he roll when he comes off the screen, he rolls hard to the rim, right? Harden's not even a big crossback guy for the most part, right? Like it's not like he tries to to really manipulate you off the screen. When he comes off the screen, he's looking to either get to his three, get to the rim, lob, or kick it out. Those those are the four options. But he needs the guy to roll to the rim. That's why he did so well with Clint Capella. That's why he was doing well with Nick Claxton. That's not what Joel Embiid does. You know, when you look at the numbers on Synergy, Joel Embiid pops way more than he rolls to the rim. And it's worked for Philly. 
Philly gets that, rolls right into a dribble handoff. He had a good thing going with Seth Curry, who's now gone. Um, but he had, you know, they rolled into other actions out of that stuff that you'd use the pick and roll to get the switch and then a post up for Joel Embiid. And that's something that you're not going to get a lot of with James Harden. In theory, this is my theory. I don't think you're going to see a lot of that when James is there. And then on top of that, then I think you have the issue of when Joel beat Joel Embiid gets the ball in the post, because you're still going to post him up because he's one of the best post players in the league. And it's such a value for you. Harden doesn't move. He doesn't play well off the ball. He's not that great of a, yeah. even with the nets, he would give up the ball and he'd still be in the same spot where he was when he gave up the ball, you know, and eventually come back to him. And that's great. But like, I think just on that and on the offensive side, just that alone really worries me defensively. I think you got a lot of issues. I think teams are going to look to attack Harden. Harden's been great in a switch scheme type of defense. That's when he cares about defense. That's usually one of the reasons why and he does a great job switching. Joel Embiid's not a guy that's going to switch out to guards. You know, he's he does a great job in center field and drop coverage, kind of keeping the ball in front of him and the and the the guy rolling to the rim and does a good job sort of playing that cat and mouse game. That only works when you have the guard fighting over the top of screens and coming to 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 get back to the ball handler. It's not going to happen very often with James Harden. Like I got massive issues with it everybody's kind of glossing over it going like look these are two great players it should just work well i don't think that's how this works well you you remember last year in the playoffs too i mean how atlanta beat them was essentially just destroying drop coverages with trey young and letting trey get to his floater letting the help come over and trey hits the kickouts deep like it was it was really impressive like that was actually the big flaw and i think that honestly they probably made this flaw a little bit more exploitable maybe is the way to put it now I, I will say this on offense so the last time that James Harden played with a great big man like this was probably 2014 Dwight Howard and you know we can equivocate or whatever on the greatness of Dwight Howard in 2014 but he was still an all-star that year, right like he was still uh right. at the back end of his prime at that point let's say uh you know, Dwight Howard posted on 50% of his possessions that year. That team won. I can't remember if that was the 52 win year or the 56 win year, but they figured it out, right? And Dwight, for as much as over the years, we wanted him to be a roller. We wanted him to be this incredible lob threat. And he was like, for the most part, whenever he would fully engage in that activity. I don't he just kind of wasn't that guy though. Like that, that's not who he was. Like they figured out how to make it work there. I just wonder if they can figure out how to make it work here. The thing that, you know, you brought up to me before the call, and I don't think you just mentioned it in what you were talking about with their offense is that they traded all their shooters or they traded their best shooter, I guess is the way to put it in Seth Curry. And now you have Tyrese Maxey as the weak side shooter. You have Danny Green, who can be hit or miss in terms of being a weak side shooter. You're Furkin Korkmaz, whatever you're getting out of Shake Milton. A lot of these guys can be inconsistent shooters. And I think that that might be a concern just in terms of the spacing for Joel Embiid whenever he's posting. Um, I wonder if they can get that same level of uh, effectiveness that Houston got all those years ago with Dwight Howard. Yeah, I mean, I'll be interested to see that. I mean, you got to just remember, too, as much as they made that pairing work, they also didn't want to work together. <laughs> right. True. And there was that, really good there was that there yeah. was that that back and forth of like, no, I want to play this way. I want you to be a roller from Harden. And from Howard's perspective, like, no, I want the ball in the post more like. And, yeah. you know, there's not a there's not a right or wrong in these instances, but you just kind of look at these things and it's like you that's not what works for Harden, right? Yeah. Like there are teams that are the, the, the product that we've seen that works for Harden and just, just on the pick and roll actions alone, spread it out with three shooters, rim roll to the, to the, uh, uh, a, a hard roll to the rim, suck in the defense. He'll either kick it out or he'll, you know, do all that stuff. Yeah. Like, what are they going to do? Put in bead in the corner. Like that's what, yeah. Well, I think that I think it's just going to be totally different. Like, I think they are going to involve Embiid in the action most of the time, and they're probably going to pop him, and we're going to see how James adjusts. 
to playing that style of basketball. I mean, we haven't seen a lot of that. Like, I'm, I'm not saying that, like, he can't do it just because in the past, we haven't seen him do that often. Like, we haven't seen that kind of setup with James Harden. He's been most successful with rim runners. I think we'll see, you know, it remains to be seen how successful he will be with more of a pop threat. Can he get to the line consistently? I mean, that's another thing that like is a factor here. Philadelphia 76ers games are going to be fucking miserable to watch. Very, very. Because <laughs> it's going to be a parade to the foul line. Like <laughs> it's going to be a just constant stream of foul shots the entire time. And, I don't know. We'll see. Um, the Brooklyn, the Brooklyn fit with Ben Simmons. Are you as look, all of this depends on them getting, you know, Ben Simmons who we all idealize and, um, you know, hope can be this incredible short roll threat and have a willingness to play off the ball and play as like a dream on green roll. If he's willing to buy into that, it's an incredible fit. I think, right? Like you're in total agreement there. I would think. Oh, I think it's a it's a big, perfect fit for the Nets, you know, um, and it's just funny. It was a perfect fit for the Nets and they got the other pieces to go with it. Draft picks, yeah. another big and Drummond and Seth Curry in, in, in that whole whole package. What I would say with Simmons is I think this is perfect because then he's going to relieve the defensive pressure off of KD, right? KD's had to guard some some of the tough yeah. opponents for the, the, the Nets just because. Yeah. They don't have a lot of defensive guys, right? They would put Ben yeah. on guys who they just waved, but like it would be a uh, up lot until, of that. Yeah, up until his injury, I thought this was arguably his, I don't know if it was his best defensive season. He's had a couple of really good defensive seasons, but this is up there in terms right. of Kevin Durant's best defensive season so far. But this is going to relieve that pressure from him. He's not going to yeah. have to do that as much. Okay, so maybe he guards the second option or third option. I think people forget, Katie's really good as a weak side defender too. Like that's yeah. something that's really going to help the Nets defensively on that end. And then he gets to focus more on the offensive end. And I think yeah. on the offensive end, KD relieves the pressure off of Simmons, you know, and Simmons doesn't have to be the guy, doesn't have to be the guy to create. He can just simply be exactly like you said, play the short role and things like that. And then when they come off the short role, if they choose to, I don't know how often we're going to see Patty Mills and Seth Curry share a court together, but that's two unbelievable shooters. Curry, uh, Curry shooting 40% from three and, and Mills is shooting 42% from three. Like that's, you want to spread the floor. You can spread the floor. You can put a guy in the dunker spot if you want, or you could have LaMarcus Aldridge kind of uh, space out just a little bit, although not much of a three point threat. I think, you know, you're able to kind of play around in that stuff, but I think offensively so much less pressure on, on Simmons. And then when it's, KD and Kyrie and Simmons out there like it's just so much easier for him on that end right and yeah. and and in that sense of like he doesn't have to worry too much about the pressure of, of of being one of the main tenants of the offense you know he's he's not even a guy that's expected to shoot on this yeah. team you know they're just going to be like the only time we want you to shoot now is if it's a layup you know or a dunk otherwise on the short roll we want you to kick it out to our shooters and get us a three I think it's just a really interesting way to piece it all together it's gonna be a while before we see all these guys on the court together though yeah no and on top of it too he makes them a real threat in transition i think like he's gonna really add that transition opportunity in a substantial way that is really gonna help them i think yeah and that he's gonna catch and go and immediately fly up the yeah. court and things and, and and with that the one thing i want to say because i'm just gonna guess preemptively and, and if it's not Mike saying it, somebody else is probably thinking it in their heads, you know, but like getting Harden is better than not having any player at all, you know, and that's what they were getting. And that's what the Sixers were getting from Simmons. Absolutely nothing. And, right. And, and for what it's worth, I, I do think that is accurate. I mean, that's a, that's a fair assessment. But to me, I'm like, you're already a team that's 10 games above 500. You're actually better than the Nets. And granted, some of that's with the injuries and things like that. But like right now, you're in a pretty good position. With, with all of that, with the shooting, you've built kind of a great uh, offensive system built around Joel Embiid's his passing's improved, things like that. Obviously, clutch games, it's a little bit more challenging. But I think it's – it's I just think it's a bit risky, right? Like making yeah, yeah, this yeah. move and making this trade and just saying like, well, we, we are trading this guy because we're not getting anything out of him. I didn't 
I, 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 I kind of look at it going like, I don't think that's necessarily the way I would view it because he's such an important asset for me. If I was more, I would have waited till the off season and, 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 and well, would have rolled the dice with what we got now. Cause I don't think you're any closer to winning a championship now than they were the, the day before this trade. Oh, wow. Yeah. I disagree with that. I do think that they're closer to me. It's more a question of opportunity costs as much as anything. Like I think that were there better options on the market, if you wait, were there better options on the market? Maybe. I think it's possible, but this is clearly what Daryl Morey had wanted. Like, that's why I tweeted earlier, like, you know, Daryl did it. Like, he achieved his goal. He waited it out, and he got a superstar, which is what he wanted to do. I don't know that I agree with Daryl's strategy insofar as, like, I don't know that it's what I would have done. But it's undeniable that he executed exactly what he wanted to do. Like it, it, to a T this is his plan from the jump was as soon as Ben Simmons said, I'm not coming to camp. I am moving this guy for a superstar. Right. He did it. He achieved that. It's just whether or not there was a better option out there. I don't well, know. Like, I don't know what the other offers were necessarily, but I think that there could have been potentially better offers where you get a multitude of pieces that really, really fit with Joel Embiid as opposed to getting one piece and then trying to build around that piece, maybe with your exceptions in the off season, maybe with some of the other guys that you have. Yeah. And good luck to doc having to change up his entire offense on the fly. You, you have fun with that. That's a good point as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to, I don't know, I'll ask you, what trade did you think was the most momentous outside of this one that happened today? When we say momentous, are we saying in terms of like, wow, this this, this really changed the landscape of, of the team, this moved the team to being a contender or whatnot? Or just a, I'll, the, I'll the be trade honest, that I, made me go like, what the hell? I used momentous because your name is Mo. Yeah, I, yeah, I no. will. Uh, <laughs> I, I will I uh, <laughs> default to you in terms of the way that you define that. Like the one that surprised me most, I guess, was the Kristaps move. Yeah, that's where I was okay. going to go. That's yeah. That trade made me. I we were on the draft show, and it made me just put my hands up. Like, what are we? What's going on? Like, I wasn't ready for a Porzingis trade. I really yeah. wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, here's the funny thing too. Like, Dallas is pretty good. They figured it out since their early season struggles, and he's been like a pretty substantial part of that. Like, it's not like he has, you know, completely fallen off a cliff in terms of his play. He's not worth 31, 34 and 36 million, which is what he has left on his contract. But he's still like really good at basketball is part of the thing. Right. Like it's kind of a Tobias Harris corollary thing where I think Tobias Harris just gets unfairly shit on all the time. Despite the fact that Tobias Harris is actually a good basketball player. Like Kristaps is still a good basketball player. It's just that like, I don't think he's reliable because you don't know if he's going to be on the court in the moments that matter because of his injury history and you can't really trust him to create shots. The other part of this deal that just confuses me is like, what is Washington? What, what is their plan? Do they know? Do they like, know? Like, that's my thing. Like they did a great job in the Westbrook trade. Right. And got yeah. some good pieces and things like that. Now, the season has gone off the rails. You have Beal out for out with the year with the, the wrist surgery and things like that. And it's it's they're in a very critical situation of what are you going to do now with Bradley yeah. Beal? Right. Like, is he like, look, I don't think that Washington deal for Westbrook was as good as like Bobby Marks thinks it was where it was like one of the best deals of all time. Right. But undeniably, they did well. Like, I think that getting off of that contract and getting who they got in, in terms of ancillary pieces to, you know, potentially work. Like, I think that they did fine getting those guys. Yeah. And, and, you know, now, by the way, flipping one of those pieces, Spencer Dinwiddie and, and Davis Bertans to, to Dallas in that trade. And we'll yeah. talk about Dallas's side here in a second. You know, the, when I look at Washington, I'm just like, I, I I'm confused and I've been confused about Washington for a while. Like, let's just be yeah. honest. Like it's getting to the point where like, what are you planning here? And I'm I'm yeah. kind of shocked. Like Beal still hasn't demanded a trade. You know, like yeah. every time I'm like, yo, like how long are you just willing to sit there and, and continue to be, to be honest, be irrelevant? 
you know, like, you don't, it, it, it yeah. doesn't matter. Like it doesn't, you know, you're young, you're 28 at this point. And, and, you know, he's going to opt into his contract with the wrist surgery and things like that, I would imagine. And then they're going to try to give him the super duper max. And then, so we're going to play this dance. And then a year, year from now, you're going to demand the trade. Like you're just wasting your time. I think it's, it's, I don't, I, I don't understand the plan for Washington. It's a big swing on Porzingis. Who's never healthy, but I guess the hope is like, Hey, if we're healthy, we can have a pretty good defense. You know, he's a good rim protector when he's when he's right. Kyle Kuzma has been really good defensively. KCP has yeah. been pretty good this season. Like they got some some pieces. Ruri Hachimura, Denny Advia, they've all been good, you know, in, on the yeah. defensive end and things like that. So maybe that's the thinking of like, hey, we're just going to start to pivot to being a full, like a really good defensive team. I just, I, I would be very worried. And, and granted, they got off. They have a, they're paying Porzingis a ton more money but his deal is shorter than I think uh, Davis Bertan. So getting off Bertan is probably a win for them. And, and, and I think that that's pretty good. And Dinwiddie hasn't worked out for them. Like there's no, it's not like they gave up a massive player in Dinwiddie, but I just, again, I'm just curious. It's just like, we'll trade you our two bad contracts for your really bad contract. Like I get confused with that. So let's talk about the Washington side first, because the thing that I can't wrap my head around in Washington is center has been like the least of their worries this year. Like they've gotten pretty good production from Daniel Gafford. They've gotten pretty good production from Montrezl Harrell, who they moved in a ancillary deal to Charlotte, who we'll talk about that in a minute. Cause I think that's actually an interesting deal as well. But like Montrezl Harrell has been really valuable to score off the bench. Daniel Gafford is a good defender. You just gave Daniel Gafford a pretty big extension. Like you're paying him $10 million a year now. That's not a terrible contract for a backup center, but like, and I guess you didn't really use assets to get off of this. Like it seemed like they wanted to end the Spencer Dinwiddie experience. They, right. uh, you know, were happy to move the Davis Bertans contract because it's a negative value contract. So it's not like they gave up assets. It's just like, you've now completely limited your flexibility moving forward. Like, it's easier to trade two mid-size contracts than it is to trade one enormous contract. And, you know, obviously this deal is an example of the fact that nobody in the NBA is completely untradeable. Even Russell Westbrook is not completely untradeable. He just, in the mid-season, it's hard to find partners that work, right? There's no contract that is completely untradeable. This Porzingis deal can be moved again, but it's easier to move... I think Dobbs Bertans and Spencer Dinwiddie, if you want to try and get flexible and make some different moves. And I know Chris Stops is good and, and like he's a, you know, 20 to $25 million a year player when he's healthy, something like that. Maybe honestly, when he's healthy, he's probably more like 25 to 30 in terms right. of value, but you can't trust that, which makes it, you know, reduce in value to an extent. And you're now just setting up like it, this, my guess on what Washington was thinking is we need to make a move to convince Brad that we are trying to get better around him. Uh, Porzingis is a swing, at least. Um, it, I, I don't... I, I'm frustrated with franchises that make those types of moves, like these massive swings yeah. that just don't make sense. You know, like here's here, look, look, a couple of things here. First off, it's like they unlearned what they learned in the Westbrook trade, right? Trading the big contract for three smaller contracts made things a lot more manageable, right? They yeah. unlearned it because they basically just reversed and did and did it all over again. Um, but like when you think about it this way, like when the Milwaukee Bucks made the swing for Drew Holiday, it made perfect sense, right? We were all going yeah. nuts about how good Drew Holiday was because Drew Holiday had a track record of helping teams and being and th solid. It, they were much closer to competing than Washington is. Right. And 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 so when you're looking at let me put it to you this way. If Porzingis was as productive in Dallas the way Drew Holiday was in New Orleans, he wouldn't have even been on the trade market. Right? right? Like cuz that's what they need what they need from Porzingis, what Washington is going to need from Porzingis is what Dallas needed from him with Luka. Right. And if you're not going to get that in Dallas understands, hey, we're not getting that. We need to get rid of it. And Washington's like, we can get it. It's like it's right. just a wild, reckless swing to me. And at that point, that's when I'm looking at it going like if you're chasing like that. You've already lost. 
You know, and yeah. maybe you get lucky. Maybe it works out. Knock on wood, Porzingis has good health and it works out and it's great because I love having more good basketball teams than bad basketball teams in the NBA. But I just think it's a wild gamble. And now you've you've made itself, you made it a very difficult contract to move. Because I'll just be honest with you. I don't imagine somebody, if it does, if Washington's going to put Porzingis back on the trade market, I don't imagine you're going to get a taker. You're going to have well, to send, what send I, an asset with that. No, I know what you're saying. It's tradable. But, but you have to what send I will an say though, with that. You probably will, but it gets easier. The longer it goes, like if he can be there for a year, he can be there for a year and a half. The contract gets shorter. Teams are more willing to deal with shorter term big money contracts than they are with longer term big money contracts. So I, I like this more for, th this is the funny thing. Like we're talking about all of the flexibility concerns now. Christoph Sporzing is still a good basketball player. Like for all the concerns that we have, like I, I have worries about just what the plan is in Washington but in terms of like a value-based construct here, right? Washington gave up a guy that they were getting like negative value from mm -hmm. in Spencer Dinwiddie on the court. Like he's just been not very good this year. And another guy that's, you know, a three-point sniper that's shooting 32% from three in Davis Bertans mm -hmm. to get a guy that's good at basketball. Like that's, if you're going to take Kristaps Porzingis, that's the kind of deal that you do it in, I think. It, it, no, I'm with you on that. I just think the 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 chances of getting what you really need out of him yeah. to convince Bradley Beal to stay is very slim, in my opinion. And I, I and totally it, agree with you in terms of like just the bigger picture. I think yeah. you're 100% right on that. And, and and that's what I mean more in the, the you're chasing, right? It's, yeah. it's really chasing at that point. And as a franchise, you don't want to be chasing. Honestly, they, they should have traded Beal a year ago. When they traded, when they, I think traded, they traded him last summer, you, when you're trading Westbrook, when you're trading, you, you know, in this situation, you should have just gone for the full rebuild and try to do it quickly and gather assets. You know, yeah. you, you're telling me you couldn't have gotten Simmons a whole bunch. You probably could have gotten more draft picks even in this instance um, from Philadelphia over the summer. Like if you if you wanted to make that move, now you're going to have to try to pay this dude the super duper max only for him to turn around and demand a trade. Like you're, it's it, it's inevitable, right? Like I just feel like that's yeah. what's coming. It's a good question. Like if you were a Wizards fan, and I don't know how Wizards fans would feel about this. If you were a Wizards fan, though, would you rather be in the position you are right now, where you have Porzingis, all of these Lakers guys, Avdia, Rui Achimura, Corey Kispert? And Bradley Beal, who still has like a player option on that deal. Or would you rather have kind of blown this thing up, moved KCP in a deal, move Bradley Beal, have Ben Simmons in place, don't have Kristaps Porzingis. Maybe you do have Kristaps. Maybe you still execute this trade, by the way. Yeah. Um, maybe it's maybe it's KCP and um, Davis Bertans for Kristaps, right? Um, cause that works money wise just off the top of my head, but like, maybe you still do this deal because Kristaps works with Ben Simmons, but like, would you rather have Ben Simmons and a start over, or would you rather have the position you're in now where you have better players, but like the better players aren't good enough to actually compete. I think it's easier to sell hope in the case where you have Ben Simmons as your building block. You're probably in the high end of the lottery this year and you're figuring it out that way. But uh, look, I don't know. I don't know if every fan feels that way. Uh, I don't know. And it's, and, and, and it's challenging. And I also think the idea of like, I have friends with who, who are fans of teams who I'm like, you guys should be really more interested in trading for Simmons. And they're, they have fans have no interest sometimes trading for, yeah. for Simmons in the sense of like, and if we're talking about it on the fan side of it, there, there, there is some of that. Like I can understand it where it's like, why would I trust Ben Simmons? to give me hope right. right and 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 so i understand it on that side it's a tough thing man and 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 one thing is as critical as we are of all these the, the trades and all of these things being a front office guy is tough Be, making it's trades so and all this it's a very hard <laughs> job like i understand it i went through it as a video guy like it's difficult so it's like you know the second guessing comes with it but it's hard and it's hard to kind of yeah. predict these things on the other side of this though is dallas and I understand the idea that they went for here. They broke the Porzingis deal up into two more manageable trade chips, basically. Uh, 
I think they're going to have an easier time moving Spencer Dinwiddie in a deal and Davis Bertans in a deal to try and rebuild and completely retool around Luka Doncic. For this year, it's worse. Like, they're a worse team. They're definitely a worse team this year. Um, they have a lot of ball handling, which is interesting. Like, Spencer Dinwiddie, Jalen Brunson, Luka Doncic are three of your, like, four or five best players now. Um I guess like Tim Hardaway, sort of, and then Dorian well, Finney got, Smith. It, it, well, Hardaway has the broken foot. Yeah, like I'm kind of. Is he gonna? I was assuming he'd be back for the playoffs. Is he not gonna be back for the playoffs? I, I will Google this as you need to fill time while I type this up. <laughs> yeah, um, but like Dorian Finney Smith's been really good this year, and but now you're gonna be completely retooling what Jason Kidd has been doing uh, on the fly. And I'm just confused, I guess, on what their ultimate goal here is. Like, is the ultimate goal, we we can't win a title this year, but we have the guy that can lead us to the title. So we want to get more flexible. We want to set up our situation in a way that allows us to be lighter on our feet in acquiring a real second star to place next to Luka Doncic. Like, I think that's the sell for Dallas here. Yeah, I think it's uh, for, first, it's generally a three month injury, according to the Internet. And the Internet has never told lies, folks. Not um, about injuries. No. <laughs> um, so uh, you could take it with a, 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 a grain of salt. But I think he, Hardaway's probably done for the year. What I, what a okay. couple of things there. One with the multiple ball handlers. Like the one thing Dallas is doing is they are getting Luca off the ball. Like they're starting a yeah. lot of actions with somebody else handling the ball and him coming to it, you know, and I, I actually kind of love it. Um, and, and, and I think now that he's in shape, it looks a lot better and it, it, it flows a lot uh, easier offensively and it allows everybody else to be a little more involved offensively. So I think there's, th that's part of it. I think the other aspect of it, and I think it's something we've been talking about when we've talked about this trade it will be easier down the road to find a home for Dinwiddie and to find a home for Bertans. You know, if it, it, assuming, uh, you know, yeah. Bertans is too good of a shooter to have all of a sudden not be able to shoot all now, right? Like, it, yeah. And, and he's the kind of like long, long distance shooter where he can shoot from like 30 feet that will give Luca even more space, right. which is and, interesting on some level. So it's a little bit weird that he just like, like, I still think like he'll find his shot again. And, you know, with Dinwiddie, I think the important thing to look at is it's not, <laughs> excuse me, going to have to add that, edit that one out. We, we won't be editing that in post. We'll be good. We'll be good. Oh, okay. So everybody, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Cause I assumed half of you said, bless you. The other half, eh, screw you. Uh, the, <laughs> always nice to tell the audience, screw you. Um, the, but with Dinwiddie, I think you're getting, what you're hoping is you're getting the Dinwiddie before KD and Irving showed up in, in Brooklyn, right? Like he was a solid player. I think he's a guy that can come off your bench. And, and when Luca's out of the game, getting rest and however few minutes that is, you can kind of turn yeah. it over to Dinwiddie a little bit more and say, go ahead, you and Jalen Brunson cook here and try to make some stuff happen so yeah. we don't really kind of bury ourselves in a hole. But you're right about one thing. This trade definitely makes them worse this season. And I think that was their understanding. And I think they looked at it saying, hey, they, they just extended Dorian Finney-Smith four years, $52 million deal. They know that they're going to have to sign Jalen Brunson in the offseason. You know, I think they're they're kind of having that understanding. I won't be surprised if there are more moves in the offseason where they start sending off some some of these guys. You know, like, listen, if I'm Dinwiddie, if I'm Bertans, I'd probably rent until next season. Like, you you might get spun off at some point in the offseason to continue to build stuff for Luka. I think it's more of a play of, like, long-term, let's start to get pieces that we can move and build. Let's go to the other move that I actually really, really was interested in. in Can like. I guess it? Can I guess yeah, it? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Derek White to San Antonio. I mean, to, from San Antonio to Boston. I loved that. That was it. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Derek White's really good. Like, Derek White yeah. is really, really good. And I can't imagine a more perfect defensive fit 
than him and Marcus Smart in a backcourt because Derek is so smart off the ball, but he's skinny and he's better at defending ones and twos and then being like kind of a menace that flies around off the ball. Whereas Marcus can defend like one through four with ease on the ball and can fly around and do a lot of different stuff. Um, Switch like in terms of switchability, like it's, that is a terrifying defensive backward. That is such a good combination. Like teams are going to have, they, they've already had the best defense in the league since the calendar turned to 2022. They just upgraded their defense. Like this is going to be a really, really fucking hard team to score on now with Derek White. Their identity is now defense. And it has been for a while, but like this is a step even further in that direction. Look, they, I trust Derek White to play point more than I trust Dennis Schroeder. I'll say that. I mean, uh, uh, and get everyone involved. <laughs> but like, do I think he can play point a hundred percent full time? I think there's some questions to be answered there, but I think you can do a little bit better of a job of it than Marcus Smart. You can play Marcus a little bit more off the ball. You can allow him to be a cutter. You can allow him to sit in the dunker spot, which he's pretty okay at. Like, you can do a lot of different stuff there. Um, and then Derek needs to shoot it at some point. Like that, that's a big thing, but I don't know. I kind of love it. I, I, it's a it, Boston fans. I think are going to love Derek. I think it's going to really work. So it's funny. Cause like it, it, it took me a long while to warm up to this tree. And, 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 yeah. and it was more because like, okay, Josh Richardson for Derek white. Like, wow, that's a really good trade for, for Boston. Okay. Romeo Langford. Yeah. Whatever. Like he's not, he's not, yeah, I, I think he's a throw in. Like, I don't yeah, really it was, it was, yeah, it was just, it was, player. it was like, okay, whatever. I still like this for Boston. Okay, now you're sending your 2022 first round pick, one through four protected. Like, let's just be honest. It's not, you're not bad enough to be, if you're Boston, you're very unlikely to be uh, uh, using this pick this year. And, it's, right. you know, I think it's going to convey to San Antonio. I said, That's a good get for San Antonio, right? San Antonio has a ton of guards. They're trying to find his, his, uh, uh, they're trying to find draft compensation with those things. I thought, wow, that's a good one there. Go like, okay, I'm okay with it. You do have to give up something. You're getting the better player. And then I kind of got a little bit put off a little Concerned. bit by the by by the swap, right? Like the 2028 swap, which yeah, yeah, I am worried about six years in the future, folks. Yes, I'm that jerk. Um, the 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 pick swap, which you don't know where either team is going to be, so it may convey, it may not convey. I always call those half a pick. Yeah. Right. So they gave away basically 1.5 picks for for and and Josh Richardson, who's playing well for Boston, who's actually part yeah. of the reason why they have one of this, the the best defenses since January is is because Josh Richardson's been playing well and he's been shooting it pretty well. Yeah. You know. And, and and I was like, wow, that seems a little bit steep. Now the thing I like that Derek White does, and I think this is a good trade for Boston. It, it took me a while to get there, but the more important thing for me is he's a ball mover. Yeah, he's not a ball yeah that's a really good call. And, and that's, that's and that's the thing they need the most. And Marcus Smart, since he's come back out of COVID protocols, or has been phenomenal in moving the ball and things like that. I still kind of don't trust that, but you know, it's another ball mover, and that's the important key there. And I think that's really going to help their offense. So I don't feel like they lost too much defensively, and they picked up a ball mover. So that's why I like the trade. I've kind of cringed a little bit, especially giving up the first round pick this year. Um, not that you know better than me if this is I don't think this is supposedly a stack draft, but there's always it's a, value. Yeah, if we assume that that pick is gonna be in like the 18 to 24 range, let's say, like something like that, it's not that much of a value. Like I, I'd rather have Derek White than you know Josh Richardson in that pick. And I guess Romeo Langford. Like Romeo Langford, I should say, is like you know, maybe a eighth man at some sure. point. Like he does have defensive value. He's another guy that is pretty good on that end, but like just they I, haven't been be, able to figure it out. I, well, I don't think he's good enough offensively. Like yeah. I, I'd be surprised if he ends up sticking in San Antonio, to be honest. But um, at least long term, and he's coming up on the point where his rookie contract is coming out. Like I, I think that they made the right move moving him. Um, yeah, you nailed it. Like it's unselfishness. It's like defensive value. It's everything that you hope for from a player on a team that just desperately needs that. And like, th this is the team that like, I thought was the at like should have gone all in for Lonzo ball last summer. Like I, I thought that they should have just went for it, 
went out and tried to acquire him. I thought he'd be a perfect point guard for guys like Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Yeah. You got, you got Derek white. Who's a very good facsimile, if not better to be Frank. I don't know if he's better long-term because Lonzo's younger and still has a little bit more room to grow, but I mean, Derek White's a very similar player in terms of style, and he's a great defender. And if he can get that jumper back to where it was, it's a great. This is a great pickup for them. I think. I think they're really good. I think this is this. This was a big one. This was a big move for them, you know. And it's going to fly under yeah. the radar because of all the fireworks and things like that. And Derek White's not quite the name that people yeah. think, but like this is this was a big one for for Boston. Again, it took me a minute to get there, folks. Just everybody relax, like a you know. The Twitter mob was a little upset with me, um, but like it's it's I, I think it'll work out just fine for them in that sense. And I think it, he's a good player, man. He's a good player. Like I, I, I'm i with you. And that's a, it's it's going to be everybody's favorite trade beyond the uh, the 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 Harden uh, Simmons trade. Let's close the loop on Boston. Um, and by the way, I think San Antonio did well. They get a first round pick and a pick swap for Derek White, who doesn't really fit their age timeline to be honest, right. because they've gone very young. And while Derek White, I believe, is in the first year of that extension, uh, he is 27 and I think turns 28 before the end of the season. He just got to the NBA so late because he took the circuitous route in college that like it's, you know, it, yeah. it's they had him for team. They had him under team control, but it's um, not not necessarily someone that's going to grow with that team. He's more of a finished ready product now. So um, great pickup from San Antonio. I think they did really well. I think they did as well as they possibly could have done in a Derek white deal, but I just really like the fit for Boston as well. Uh, let's yeah. close the loop on Boston though. Uh, they acquired Daniel Tice back from the Houston Rockets for Dennis Schroeder, Ennis freedom and Bruno Fernando. Ennis has already been told that he will be waived by Houston um, as soon as they complete this deal. Uh, Houston, I believe, is cutting Armani Brooks. And who is the second guy that they're cutting? They're cutting someone else. The the big one I wanted to mention was Armani Brooks because I think someone should actually claim him um, on waivers, like one of these teams that's not really competing and has a roster spot. I think that would be pretty valuable for them. He's a good shooter. He's you know on a really valuable contract that I think has one year, maybe two years left. But they keep Schroeder. For this year, I guess he's another ball handler for them on a team that doesn't really need more ball handling and selfish ball handlers. Uh, I also have no idea what Houston was doing keeping Eric Gordon. That's the one that I can't wrap my head around. Like he's finally healthy. He's played really well. He's shooting the lights off the ball. Like, could they not get a first round pick for him? Or even two seconds, like I, that's the thing. Like I don't, I'm very curious. That that one, that one frustrates me. On on that end, good I mean, for Boston. I'll say this: Kelly Eco at the Athletic reported that they wanted not just like a late first; they wanted like a mid first round pick for him. Maybe it was them setting their sights too high, um, and letting their stomach get bigger than, or letting their eyeballs get bigger than their stomach. I don't know. You know, and they've done this before, right? Like they did this with Victor Oladipo. Like we're only going to trade him for a first and then they ended up caving and sending him for two seconds um, yeah. to Miami last season. But like when I kind of just look at the way like, that's just not smart, right? That's just bad, no. bad asset management as a, t as a team there, you know, no problem. I think, you know, t uh, for Boston Tice adding another big man, you know, Robert Williams, as good as he is, has a tendency to kind of get in and out of the lineup. Al Horford's almost as old as dust. I think you have a lot of like, you know, it's just adding depth and that stuff. And in the Eastern Conference, you need bigs. Yeah, you really do. You know, it's like yeah. <laughs> Joel Embiid, Giannis Antetokounmpo, you know, like the 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 Twin Towers over in Cleveland. Like you need some size. Okay, okay so here's thinking of this now. Here's a really good question for you. Mm -hmm. In a seven game playoff series, would you take Boston or Philadelphia? Ooh, that's a really good question. That's a really good matchup, though, isn't it? That's because a, that's probably Boston that's... has a lot of guys that they can throw at James Harden. They have a lot of bodies that they can throw at Joel Embiid, and they have I, the shot creators to be able to take advantage of that drop coverage situation. I'm actually going to go with Boston, and 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 part of my thinking on this equation is adding Derek White. They don't have to change. 
Philly's yeah. going to have to change how they're going to do things. And they have whatever, 20 games, 25 games left to do that in. And now you're hoping also James Harden's healthy. You're hoping Joel Embiid stays healthy, knock on wood. You know, you're, you are you got a lot more variables with Philly, whereas the moves that Boston made weren't drastic and they got better. So I'm just going to have to – I'm going to go uh, – gonna go boston in a crazy seven game series though in a vacuum i think philadelphia is a better team i think that's a very good matchup for boston in the playoffs like i think that's actually a really problematic matchup for philadelphia if those two teams were to meet because thibel can only guard one can only guard right. brown or tatum you know and then who right. are you putting the other guy on you know and they're and they're going to go after Maxi and they're going to go after Harden defensively and it's going to be a it's right. going to be an issue for the Sixers. The well, Sixers, the, in Philly, Philly will try and throw Dar- Danny Green on the other right. one, and I yeah. think that what Boston will do is they'll try and run a bunch of off ball actions to try and get a switch with one of Harden and Maxi onto Tatum or Brown, and, 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 and then and we'll see what and, happens. And the other challenge for Philly too is because Thibault is not that good of a shooter, you you have that limitation offensively. So it's it's it would be a really I'm, that's my second hope for a playoff series. My first hope is Philadelphia, uh, Brooklyn. Like, we need that now. Like, come on. We got to have it. We got to have it now. Okay. Um, the other move that Boston made was just to get off some money. P.J. Dozier and Bull Bull uh, to Orlando. I, let's keep going, though. Let's go to yeah. this weird four-team deal that, like, I haven't really wrapped my head around yet entirely. The Milwaukee Bucks get Serge Ibaka and two second round picks. The Sacramento Kings get Dante DiVincenzo, Trey Lyles, Josh Jackson. The LA Clippers get Rodney Hood and Shemi Ojale. And the Detroit Pistons get Marvin Bagley in what has been seemingly a year long quest to acquire Marvin Bagley from the Detroit Pistons. Um, I think I like this most for Sacramento. Uh, They, just end up moving Marvin Bagley in a deal where I thought they were going to have to move him for like a second round pick and they get Dante DiVincenzo, who I think if the shooting comes back, the further he gets from his ankle injury, uh, which ankle injuries obviously just destroy shooting efficiency because you don't have legs. You just don't have the same jumper that you do before the injury. It takes some time for those guys to get back from those ankle injuries. Um, if the shooting reverts, he's a perfect complement to the De'Aaron Fox, uh, Demonis Sabonis core that they just built this week in Sacramento. To get that from Marvin Bagley, I think is a win for them. But you know, uh, where are you at on this thing? So I think the I think for I'm not that big on Divincenzo. Um, yeah, I think he's helped. He's been in bad this year. It's worth it, saying it, that. Like, yeah, no, but like I mean, I know what he's done for for. Milwaukee yeah. in years past and, and he was an important piece and then when he went down like that's a big that's a big injury and I think it, it, here's the bad news he's going to be bad all year because it just takes a long time to recover from that you know right. to no fault of his own for everything you said like that's just a tough injury to come back from and all of a sudden be shooting well right away like it'll be probably a thing more next year I like it for Detroit let's continue to add a, another young guy um, reclamation project a little bit let's see what we have with him and he, it here in the end of the season and if this is a guy that we're going to look to kind of like hey we're going to offer the the he's a restricted free agent or they're just going to pick up his option i'm confused where he's at so bagley will be a restricted free agent so i don't know that you can really offer him the qualifying offer i don't think you can at this point right because he got traded. his well you can no like he'll, he can be offered the qualifying offer like logistically it's more that the qualifying offer for marvin bagley is pretty high because he was a high pick right i believe it's pretty high in like i think it's still even going to be like seven million something like that like uh it's it's weird so like he it can either be 14.8 million or 7.3 million depending on how many games he starts uh, Marvin Bagley so far this year has started for the Sacramento Kings as basketball reference loads for me because he was actually in the starting lineup for a little while here. Uh, he has started 17 games already. We are how many games through the year? I mean, he'd have to start every game probably for 
the Pistons moving forward. If I was them, I would just not start Marvin Bagley for the next three weeks. And that way the qualifying offer is 7 million. I, He's still not worth 7 million, but you can at least like offer that qualifying me. offer and not risk him picking up a $15 million qualifying offer. The problem though, is that if you offer him the qualifying offer and I'm sorry, I'm going on long, the Pistons have cap space this summer. He is going to have an immensely high cap hold from being the number two overall pick. And that's going to eat into their cap space and not allow them potentially to sign someone like, you know, Jalen Brunson, who it said reportedly they have interest in. It's another option for them, certainly. And they can figure that out and they can make it work mechanically in terms of like signing him to a contract for three years, 25 million or whatever they're going to give them and then sign Jalen Brunson. But that's $8 million in cap space they wouldn't have. So it's another ball in the air that throws Detroit's off season into a weird flux. They must really like Marvin Bagley to have uh, gone for this though, I think is what it comes down to. Yeah. And, and they've been looking at Bagley for a long time, right? So this yeah. is just another reclamation project to me though. The, the big part of this trade the most important part is Serge Ibaka going to Milwaukee. They've yeah. they've been they desperately needed another big. Serge has looked pretty good as of late. The past, I mean, the, let's be honest, the Clippers were showcasing the hell out of him, um, and 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 he's looked really good in that process. And I think it's something for Milwaukee going like, yo, we need another big. Our front course of Giannis and 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 Bobby Portis is just not enough. And that's a correct assessment. We don't know what's going to happen with Brooke Lopez. And if he's coming back, this is just good. Another good big. And he could stretch the floor a little bit with his shooting. I think that was just for me. I like that was actually a very sneaky, good trade for Milwaukee to just add another big man that they desperately needed. And who knows what they're going to get in the buyout market. Yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned the, shooting aspect of Serge Ibaka. That's a really good fit for them. They need the shooting. Uh, I worry a little bit about him in drop coverage. He can, you know, kind of, kind of float a little bit all yeah. over the place uh, in drop. He's not like, he's never been the most positionally sound defender, I guess, Serge. But if you can kind of limit the, limit the movement, maybe you make it easier on him. And it's obviously easier on him whenever he has Giannis and Tedekumpo floating on the backside and, you know, cleaning up every single mess imaginable, but it's a really good offensive fit. It's another big to give them minutes. I agree. I think it's a really good pickup. I, I mean, like, I don't, I, I'm surprised that they, I, I guess they got two seconds as well with Dante uh, moving Dante and getting two seconds is probably, but, probably but I, a better move, I guess. But I also yeah. think the addition of the ultimate heel, Grayson Allen has kind of, allow the lessen the, oh, the, totally. the need of yeah. Di Vincenzo, right? Like, I don't feel like they're going to miss. There was him. no way they were re-signing him. No. Way. Yeah. And, and so, you know, just getting that value now, I think is it's, it's a smart one. And this is in a position of need. I thought was like a really, really good one. Cause like we just said, like, yo, teams need, uh, uh, big men in the East, you know, like the one thing I'm looking at Brooklyn's roster, I'm like, you guys don't have a stretch big a little right. Aldridge a little bit, but like, you don't really have after that, not the way, Blake Griffin's looked and things like that. Like after that, it really gets very tough for them. But a lot of these teams are going to need that. And I think that's why, you know, Serge Ibaka is going to play a pretty important role for Milwaukee, I think, going going forward. And I thought that was a, a, a sneaky little pickup for them. Yeah, like I, I'm assuming that Brooklyn will play small in most games. And then they acquired Andre Drummond in this deal, essentially to like bang with Joel Embiid when necessary. How small can they play? Can they get away with Kyrie, Curry, and Mills? Like, that's too small, right? Like, that that's like, Mo, you're going nuts, right? And even though you have KD and Simmons behind them, yeah. like, that's, that's a little too much, right? Like, you almost... Yeah, I'd feel a lot better if it was Joe Harris and not Patty Mills. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Just in it, terms I, of size. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. It's almost like, I don't know. That's why I don't know if you're going to get Curry and Mills on the floor that much together. Um, you yeah. know, when, when, Ir especially when Irving's playing. Um, so I think it's a, a, a very interesting, you know, does this mean like Cam Thomas is really going to have to step up? Sorry. We, we just keep sliding back to that monster trade, but like, I'm just curious. It's, it's, but that's going to be a position of need that, you know, 
Milwaukee filling that stretch big thing is really going to open the door and allowing them to stay pretty big for the most part, I think is pretty awesome. And, and just their versatility, their lineup versatility, because yeah. with Allen's playing, Pat Connaughton's done a good job for them. Like, I think they're fine with where they're at. I think Milwaukee's pretty good. And the other thing with the Nets I'm realizing as well is Steve Nash obviously has that connection with the Golden State Warriors in the past, right? And I'd imagine that they're going to keep starting Nick Claxton uh, when they're fully healthy, right? So what they'll do is they'll start Simmons and Claxton and Durant, and they'll operate offensively in a similar way to how Golden State operates with right. Kevon Looney in the starting lineup. They'll put Nick in the dunker spot and kind of make it work that way, I would think. Uh, and they'll play some high-low actions with Simmons. But Simmons has always been a better kick-out passer than lob passer, so – It'll be in, that'll be an adjustment, I think, because he year. never really had a lob threat. In you know, Joel Embiid wasn't quite a lob threat. See, I put it full circle. There we go. Yes, oh my God, Mo. <laughs> we, we're rolling. We're rolling here. Okay, uh, this Toronto trade was interesting. They moved Goran Dragic and a future first round pick to the San Antonio Spurs for Thaddeus Young, Drew Eubanks, and a second round pick. They have since already told Drew Eubanks that he will be waived. Essentially what this move is, they traded down something like 12 to 15 spots in the 2022 draft in order to acquire Thaddeus Young, another one of these dynamic ball handling, passing, playmaking, six foot six to six foot nine uh, swing players who can uh, just operate with the ball in their hands. Thaddeus Young can act as a big. He was one of the best subs in the NBA last year playing as a small ball five for the Chicago Bulls. Um, I'd imagine that's how they're envisioning him. They're envisioning him as like a small ball four or five, and they're just going to keep playing small and keep playing with Pascal and Scotty Barnes and OG and and all these guys that are that size. And now Thaddeus young. And I love it. I love the experiment. I'll say that. Uh, uh, Masai has a type man. Like it's just too funny. Like we're just every six, eight long lanky wing is yeah. going to end up at some point on uh um uh the toronto raptors and you like, know what though one of my favorite teams to watch in the nba i love yeah. watching toronto I, I i i don't blame you they are fun to watch it's pretty wild with with that stuff it's it's pretty interesting i think it's fun in the regular season it's going to be a problem a little bit for them in the playoffs yeah uh, just just again lack of size being an issue um we'll see if that gets addressed in the the buyout stuff I really like this for the Spurs. Another first round pick for them. You know, uh, they're obviously Dragic didn't matter. They were buying him out. We all kind of knew wherever Dragic was going, most likely he was going to get bought out. I kind of like what they did there. And I think they put together a nice little, little uh, uh, trade deadline for them. And, and for Toronto to get to just really the bulk of it, because they're going to actually have a player just more depth, you know, just another way to yeah. keep the, 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 the party rolling, you know, and I think it's going to be interesting going, going forward. I don't have too many more thoughts beyond that one. Yeah. And I think it is worth focusing very briefly on San Antonio here, just because they now have three first round picks in a draft that isn't seen by like me and other evaluators as being all that great, but getting this many assets, getting this much player control, it kind of gives you a, some ammunition to potentially move up in the draft and get the guys that you really love, or it gives you just a lot of player control over young players as you're rebuilding. And that's always valuable as well. So um, I, I think San Antonio has done really, really well in kind of keeping their important core youngsters, uh, keeping DeJounte Murray and Josh Primo and Devin Vassell and Keldon Johnson and then accentuating around them. And now we'll see if they can go out in free agency this summer and maybe get a big and we'll see what happens when they do that. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I, like I, if, if I, I was them, I would offer Deandre Ayton all of the money, the money in right. the world. Like right. just give him so much, whatever we will he give wants. you the river walk. <laughs> yes. We will literally give you the river walk. That's the, it move. will be called the Ayton walk. Let's go, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and go from there. That would be, that's an interesting one. I like, I like that, that idea. I want to oh. throw something at you. Cause it just kind of got reported now. And it's pretty funny to me. It's a trade that didn't okay. happen. Chris Haynes reported on uh, uh, ESPN, on, excuse me, on NBA on TNT. Uh, the Lakers say they declined a Rockets offer of John Wall and a first-round pick for Russell Westbrook. 
they declined a first round pick. Like that seems funny to me. You sure right? that like it wasn't the pick wasn't reversed? Because yeah, like like. But here's the thing: like if you get that pick, you can then move that pick for another piece. Right, and that's why I'm like, if 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 that's the way the trade stood out, and the Lakers actually turned down a chance to have, I don't know any sort of draft compensation and an actual asset beyond Taylor Horton Tucker. Yo, you need to fire Polinka right now. Now, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the, 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 the tweet was mixed up or something or whatever, but like, that just seems too weird to me. Where are we at? Chris Haynes. Let's, let's see here. Let's see. Chris, Chris is fantastic. Chris is so good at this. He's great. Um, Lakers declined rockets offer of John Wall in a first round pick for Russell Westbrook. That is unfathomable to me. Um, Does it like that, what? I mean, what are you doing? Sometimes the trades that don't happen are a lot more fun to talk about. But like, this is just like, this is asinine. If that's if that's really something the Lakers turn down when they desperately need assets and they don't have a draft pick for a while because of the the Anthony Davis trade, like that that just seems like a a, a, a wild thing. Also, Houston, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you offering a first round pick? Well, I think th- doesn't John Wall have one extra year? Is that right? I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. But even if that's the case, you got to get. I'll be honest with the Lakers. Just seeing it here in LA, they got to get the dude out of LA. The, the Laker fans are, are 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 acting like Philly fans. Oh, I mean. Mm-hmm. That game last night, look, I know Russ didn't play. Like, this, that was no fault of Russell Westbrook at all, that game last night. But, I mean, they, they lost to the law firm of Watford, Ellaby, and Brown last right. night. Like, all due respect to those Blazers youngsters who worked their ass off. They fought. Like, they wanted that game more than the Lakers. But that that might be the worst loss I've ever seen LeBron take. That's a, that's a bad one. And just so you know, they have the same contract length, Wall and, and, and Westbrook. So that, just, uh, that's what that's a question for me then. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? That makes me wonder if there were more strings there. Like, yeah, maybe, that's maybe a, there was like a first round pick involved, but like like logically, 20, 47. I, I guess I'm just <laughs> Yeah, like <laughs> Logically, there has to be some, there has to be like another shoe to drop there. I feel like it, it couldn't I, have just been John Wall and a first round pick for Russ. There's just like, th- that doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Hold on a second. Somebody we, we else. Got, we got Johnny. Mo. We got reporter Mo. No, first off, God help you. If I'm a reporter, <laughs> we're all screwed. Okay. I'm just telling you right now, I'm going to get the date of when the asteroid is going to hit us wrong by like four <laughs> oh, days and, and it's going to be the wrong way. We're going to be all dead. So reporter Mo should not exist, but uh, and I, I'm by the way, this, this is no, what I'm saying here. I absolutely no shots at Chris Haynes. I'm sure that. Okay. Chris no, Haynes is no, right. No, 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 no. The tweet was wrong. The video says the Lakers turned down Westbrook and a first for John wall, not the other way around. It, okay. Now I'm a little bit okay, more. We're calm. Good. We and, got and, it. And, and, sorry, we folks. I needed out. to work myself through this one. Cause I was getting into a little bit of a tizzy. Um, so I needed to work through this one. I'm glad we got it fixed. I wasn't able to watch the video cause I was on the pod with you, but um, no, yeah, but so. the tweet is wrong. The tweet was wrong. We had, we had a little bit of a concern here. Um, okay. I good. Rob Polinka, I don't think I would have done that. No, I yeah. wouldn't have done it either. I wouldn't have done it either. Um, um, okay. We have one more deal here that I want to talk about for sure. And it's, Montrez Harrell for Ish Smith and Vernon Carey. Uh, I think LaMelo is going to make Montrez Harrell so much money. <laughs> like, I hate this for Charlotte. <laughs> I don't because whatever. Look, it, it's it's just so low cost. Like I know no, no, the, the, the risk of it and, and everything like that. But it was just like they need, better. They needed they need defense. They need a big no, I know. a little bit like a little they bit need just, defense. Just You're a hundred percent right that they need defense. We're gonna get a ton of highlights. I get it. But the coach in me is dying. Okay, like <laughs> I need mean, like a, a modicum of defense, and Charlotte's gonna be pretty good. I agree, but if this was the option that was on the table, I mean, it's an upgrade over Mason Plumley. 
you know, like Montrez I mean, Harrell in pick and rolls with LaMelo ball with all of the spacing that they have, that's going to be really good. Like he is going to average 17 points a game in there. Like I don't really have too many concerns I'd, about that. I'd rather still see PJ Washington play more. I'd rather see it. Like I'm not, but they're not going to do that. Like it, I can't do that. I just, I just tell you what I want, Sam, what I want. Okay. It's all about me. Okay. We, like I'm with that. Like, I agree with you. Like, I think PJ Washington's really good. Like, I think that someone should have tried to steal him from right. Charlotte. Like I, I think I literally wrote in a column 36 hours ago that like Sacramento should have offered Rashawn Holmes for, Mason Plumley and PJ Washington and just seeing what happens. Right. Right. But this is better for Charlotte because they get Montrez Harrell, who is a pretty close approximation, a little bit different in terms of styles to Rashawn Holmes. And they get him basically for free because Vernon Carey's not an NBA player. And I mean, that, Ish Smith yeah. is like a backup point guard. So like, don't, don't you let Tom Haberstroh hear you this Ish Smith though. Tom Haberstroh. He's a good backup point guard, but like, <laughs> <laughs> they got Lamelo, and they got they got enough ball handling. They're good. Like, I no, mean, I understood. I understood why they did it. I just don't. I just don't think it's anything that moves the needle in any way. It doesn't. It doesn't. Besides the fun highlights that we're gonna get, like that's my problem with Charlotte right now. You're just gonna be a highlight factory right now. Are you gonna be a win factory? And they're in the playing tournament. Can you get out of it? Like that's when are you gonna be the substance? And, and 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 not go with style all the time. I think that's kind of my my thing with uh with this trade with Charlotte. I mean, and it's just me being me, Sam. Yeah. Uh, but it's like I, get it. I just think like okay, so you you made a trade to make a trade. At the end of the day, that's well, what it well, feels like. Here's the other thing too. Montres Harrell has been a combustible personality throughout his career. Let's say that like there was literally just a report of like a fight in the locker room with him. Um, you know, he, he, he has been that way before let's go with, mm -hmm. and it's not to say he's a bad person. He's definitely not. Like, I th yeah. think he's just, he's emotional in terms of the way that he operates. And we literally just had a situation in Charlotte with James book night, like going off and like trying to like charge it James Borrego, like on the sideline to have a conversation with him in the middle of the third quarter of a basketball game. So <laughs> not not the best time, young Brooke. Not the best time. Like what? Are, no, no. I understand it. Like maybe maybe you're right. Like maybe it's a little bit too much. But yeah. the on court fit is amazing because Lamelo Ball has not had a pick and roll partner like this before. No, it's it's going to be great. And like I said, we're going to get a ton of highlights. We're going to get a lot of that stuff. And we're only going to get what? Where are they? Like one playing game from them. Uh, you know, like I just kind of look at it going like this is this is, you know, like what are we what are we yeah. doing? You know, I mean, and, they're probably going to finish 10th. They're probably going to finish 10th because Atlanta is going to jump them. All the teams ahead of them, I think, are better. But it's fun. Like, give me give me give me something, Mo. Give me some. Fun. All like, of I, this I has been fun. fun. What do you want, Sam? <laughs> All of this has been fun. Oh, my God. I woke up and my brain was about to explode from like 90 different trades happening. Um, too much. Unbelievable. Anything else? Do you want do you want to talk about the fact that the Lakers did nothing like that's insane to me? That they just couldn't even figure one thing. No, out it, here it's, to you, do? you know, it's it's not insane to me. Because there just wasn't anything out there, you know, like I don't and, 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 and in the sense of like, they've done such a horrible job yeah, putting this team together. And now it's like when your best package is Kendrick Nunn, who hadn't played a game all season and according to Polinka won't be playing till March and, and Taylor Horton Tucker, who had promise last season and has not fulfilled it this season and a first round yeah. pick in 2027. Like if that's your best package, you screwed up. You, you, you don't have a lot, you know, and I don't think that's something that's going to interest you. I mean, was there any trade that you're looking at going like I, I, they could, they should have called the Lakers and gotten that other package. Was there any trade in there that you felt like that, that broke down today that you felt like the Lakers could have beat that offer? Like, there no, I, I, I'm just trying to think like, what were there any other players on the board? 
I mean, like I'm, I'm still totally thrown by the fact that Eric Gordon didn't get traded. Like that, that was the that, guy that I thought they should have chased. But like, then again, if the Rockets weren't willing to trade Eric Gordon, then they probably weren't willing to take Taylor Horton Tucker and Kendrick Nunn in a pick. Right. right. So like, you know, it's tricky. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, try, so I'm trying to think of like who the guy is. It's hard to find the guy, I guess. Right. And, and, and for me, like on, on my end, like I'm surprised to be honest, I'm actually surprised Golden State didn't try to get a big. Maybe they're banking on the trade deadline. The um, buyout market. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, the buyout market. The trade deadline. Just, see, my brain's fried at this point. Um, so good luck to my editors whenever I have to write tonight. That's going to be fun for them. Well, um, uh, here's one. Here's one that's pretty funny, actually. Like, just give him what he went for. And I saw that Bill Orem tweeted that they considered this. Um, Dennis Schroeder. Yeah. Bring him back. Bring him back home, baby. Well, he's a buyout. <laughs> he's a buy. He's been. He's, he's going to get bought out. Might be a buyout this, candidate. This yeah. is this is their thing. But you know, for me, the Warriors, I felt like needed a big. Hopefully, they'll address. Maybe they'll address that in the buyout market. But for me, with the Lakers, it just wasn't anything to be done, man. Like you just everybody would. You know, remember there was that run where like, oh, the Lakers have interest in Jeremy Grant. Yeah. So do the other 28 teams. Yeah, like, they it's, actually it's, did not have the assets to acquire Jeremy Grant. Like, right, there's just you know, no way. You know, and it's like, you know, or it's like the, the Lakers get mentioned in every trade proposal of like the Lakers are interested in this guy. It's like, yeah, how are you going to get him? Like what? <laughs> like that's your, that's the thing. And I think that was just their problem that they ran into in the trade deadline. So when people were like, what do you expect the Lakers to do? I was like, nothing. I expect them to make phone calls and not be able to pull off the trade. I'd have been more surprised if they did pull off a trade. Than, the the than- interesting one for me that I wonder is just given, look, the Knicks acquired Cam Reddish for a reason, or at least the front office did, let's say. Right. Right. Uh, I wonder if like Kendrick Nunn, a second round pick would have allowed the Knicks to save face on what has been a disaster level scenario with Tom Thibodeau, uh, just not playing Cam Reddish. Uh, I I wouldn't do that. I'm not saying that Leon Rose should have done that, but if Tom Thibodeau was just flat out, not going to play Cam Reddish, like even in games where they're shorthanded, really, I I mean, I'm, I'm not saying there are worse ideas either. Oh, no. I mean, the Knicks probably should have made a move to at least free up space so that you could see what the guy has. Right. Yeah. Like that's that's just the problem there with with management and, and coaching staff and, and, and your coach not being on the same page there. And that's that's a big one there with, with that, because you gave up a first round pick for, him, yeah. you know, and, 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 and that's something that like that that hurts you if you're not even going to bother playing them. And that's I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised the Knicks didn't make a move a little bit and he just can't in- be aggregated it's the problem like you right. can't aggregate him in a trade right now because but i would salary cap rules but, but not yeah. even but i mean tr- trading a uh uh trading the guys ahead of him to make sure he has that availability yeah, um, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know i'm sur- i'm a little bit surprised there wasn't a trade like that for the knicks but also there may not have been a lot of interest in those guys you know and kemba walker and yeah. fournier and stuff like that's hard it, you know it's it's a lot of times when people are frustrated that their teams didn't do anything and you see the meme of like, come on, do something. And some, you know, the poking of a stick or anything like that. Trust me, they made calls. Just teams weren't I'm interested sure in did. what you got, you know, like it's sometimes that's part of it, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and that's part of the trade deadline. Mo, is there anything else you want to talk about? You want to get out of here? Like what are, are we good? I mean, we're talking basketball. Or you want to talk life? Like, what do we got here, bud? I'm I'm here. I mean, what do you what do we what do we got here? Do we do we have Book of Boba Fett thoughts? Do we have like what? Yo, are, what, I got a lot of Book of Boba Fett thoughts. Have, have you seen? Have do, you, are you caught up on the the finale? I caught it last night. Okay, let's uh, spoiler warning. Let's let's do this then. Okay, so if you want to not hear anything about the Book of Boba Fett, please shut off your feed now. Mo and I are going to discuss. Um, okay. I've given people fair warning. I'm still giving people fair warning. I'm making sure you can get to your phones. Fair warning over Mo. I would love to hear your thoughts on book of Boba Fett. I was kind of disappointed. Um, yeah, I, 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 I felt very let down. It felt like a show where they just wanted to introduce all the other characters for other shows down the road. A little bit and of that, yeah. 
and 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 I felt like you know I, listen I was never like a massive Boba fa- fan like the way the the, the yeah, yeah, p- yeah. people obsess about him. But there, like, there's like fandom culture that is just like absolutely all about Boba Fett. I, I'm more with you. Like I'm not like a you know enormous. I fan. I got super hyped up when we had Cad Bane in the in the previous uh, episode, yep. and was just kind of disappointed that now he's gone. Right? Like what are we like? We think so, right? Because like the blinking light is still blinking, like on his chest. At the yeah. End. So like, I hope he's still alive, but like. Also, how many times are we going to keep doing this then? Right? Because the yeah. um uh Timothy Oliphant's character is still alive, right? And and now in the right. back to tank at the very end. And and all of that. How many times are we gonna keep doing the resurrection stuff? <laughs> Star but you know Wars, what like... though? I, I needed the Timothy Oliphant resurrection stuff. I think we all I did. Re- I really need Raylan Givens in space. No, no, like, I, I think I we re- I, we all <laughs> I really did need it. and like we were all kind of like worried. <laughs> Right, like when it when it was yeah. coming in that shootout, but also like Cad Bane's such a badass character, and I love the way character. they the way they introduced him in the other episode. I thought was awesome, and I was yeah. like, yeah, I'm all in. Um, so I think, it, but everything else just kind of felt underwhelming, you know. Like it wasn't a show about Book of Boba Fett; it was a show about the other characters around Book of Boba Fett who are all gonna have spinoffs. You know, and, yeah. and set up the Mandalorian season three, which I'm all hyped for, by the way. Uh, very happy yeah. for the reunion. Not that different than Daryl Morey and James Harden. We got Grogu and 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 the Mandalorian again. Although I did kind of want to see... done here. I'm literally going to create a Photoshop. Of... Oh, you don't have to. Or it's probably already on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, of like James Harden jumping into Daryl Morey's arms, like uh, uh, Grogu did with. Mandalore with Mando in the uh final episode. Literally and, doing it. My only thing is I was really hoping at some point Grogu was gonna pull out the, the lightsaber as well. Like I got oh, both. That would have been amazing. Would have been so good. <laughs> you know, like I was kind of hoping for that. But um, you know, it's it's it is what it is. It wasn't as good as I was hoping for. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not gonna watch any of the other Star Wars things. It's my perfect, it is my yeah. cool down thing you know to pop on a disney plus show whether it's marvel or star wars um yeah. and 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 cool down for the night after games so um yeah yeah i wish i just wish it was more i wish they put more of a story behind boba fett and like let's really yeah. do something there was the problem was that there was a story it was a somewhat interesting story it's just the like okay so there's never any, there's never any intent. There's never any motivation that makes sense there. And on top, like they introduced a lot of really interesting ideas, but because they essentially had four episodes to introduce those ideas, because the final three, or let's say two and a half of the final three episodes are essentially Mandalorian episodes. Right. They, for instance, introduced this really cool idea of, you know, him having this Tuscan Raider family and then they just kill them. Like I was waiting for a Tuscan Raider the, family to show up. Like I was like, yo, just like in the, like in the hope of character development, like tragedy and character development. And then he just like slaughters those bikers. And it's just like, oh yeah, they didn't actually do anything. And it's just like, what, what are we doing here? Like what, what's he, happening here? But even that payoff. Right. So like when he finds out, it doesn't work. Right. Like when he finds out, yo, it, it was actually the pikes that killed them and not the, the, the biker gang. It was like, okay, that's, that's yeah, you, it. The show did not put in the time in order to make that work. Um, I also didn't love much of what Robert Rodriguez brought to the show. Uh, I think all of the like color bikes, all mm. of like the, uh, you know, the more modern looking things was probably Robert Rodriguez just in terms of vision. And look, like this is a Disney show. This is an enormous property. I can't imagine that it was only Robert Rodriguez. Right. But like it, it didn't work. Like, I, and I didn't love the pacing of the action scenes that he directed. I, like you go back, you look at, for instance, the second episode, which was directed uh, by Steph Green. Right. Mm. That train heist was incredibly well paced. It was just, that was the best part boom, of the series. Boom, right? It was perfect. Yeah. But then you watch the final episode, which I enjoyed. Like I loved the final episode. I thought it was great. But it was just like flashbang, boom, boom, and there was no pacing. It never built. Like it was, um, it was just thing happening after thing happening, and 
I, I would like them to just not employ Robert Rodriguez to do Star Wars anymore, I guess, is where I'm at. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Like it was the Boba Fett stuff didn't really work. And now it seems like they're setting up for him to just like pass off this community to another, to like Cobb Vanth is what, what I've read for, for, by the final scene was just like, Oh yeah, we're not really built for leading. So now we're going to heal Cobb Vanth and he's going to be the marshal of this town. Right. Marshal Raylan Givens of Mos Espa. Um, I mean, the coolest thing, the the cool idea that I wish they kind of did, because I kind of was sensing this a little bit, was um, what's uh, Ming Mingwei's character's name? Um, Ming Na Wen is Fennec Shan. Fennec Shan. I wanted to see Fennec Shan turn on Boba. That would have right? been great. And yeah, they were know, setting that up. You know, they were kind of setting it up where she kept questioning, like, why are you doing it this way? Why this? Why that? Like, it would have been dope if instead of her going to assassinate the, the pike leaders at the end she went and made a deal with them or something and kind of flipped it a little bit and then give us yeah. a conflict for what's going to come next down the road right like going yo boba ain't the guy i thought he was he's never yeah, going to be totally. able to hold this you know like you know it, it would have been a fun little flip of this and i just wish they kind of did something they had a chance to do a little more fun with it but again it just felt like it was all about the other properties and not this one. And I hope it's not going to be the case with, and I love let's, let's have crossover with some of these shows and things like that. And, and, and yeah. that stuff, but I hope like, but yeah, seriously, like it was literally two episodes of, of Mandalorian, you know, well, they're and, and, clearly, they're clearly building like MCU star Wars, right? They're building yeah. like this universe out. That's the goal, I think. And I'll be honest, like, I, I don't know if I need another book of Boba Fett, series like I, I don't know if i need another boba fett centric show well we didn't I had get a one great now. time like <laughs> we... <laughs> I, I had a great time like I, like though especially the second episode and the last three episodes I, I have you know some general questions about like the motivations of characters in the finale and i think that some of it didn't land because not enough time was spent developing these you know developing the pikes or developing whoever right i still had a great time with it like I still had an absolute blast just watching this show and for it, particularly watching all of the Mandalorian stuff. I got so excited, like in the fifth and sixth episodes, I thought it was amazing. And I love the, I love the seventh episode, everything with Mandalorian and with Grogu was phenomenal. Like it was all so good. I, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, and, and I want to be clear. I enjoyed watching the show right like it's it's i like being in the star wars world and things like that and and investing that time it was just like at the end of each episode it's like all right cool okay that's how i like, felt for the first four or that's yeah. how i felt at the end of the first episode the third episode and the fourth episode was but I, okay fine i i am excited for the dark saber and to see how that whole kind of thing you know mm -hmm. mando start learning how to use that and 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 things like that but overall yeah. like still pretty Pretty, pretty interesting. I am happy to know that Grogu's going to be still alive. You know, Kylo Ren, when he tears down uh, Luke's yeah, uh, totally. uh, 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 Jedi school, we know that Grogu's probably yeah. not there at this point. So um, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty happy for that. Cause that little guy, I, he's second to my dog, but I love that little guy. <laughs> just protect him at all costs. I'm yes. so glad that he has uh, just a little, little, little armor now to protect yeah. them that's all we little needed bit, little bit. need to get um, a little helmet little 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 yoda helmet that's it get him a little mandalorian helmet this is what we okay. need um mo this has been very fun uh, <laughs> a lot, a please lot fun. tell the people where they can find your work tell the people um where you were earlier today doing stuff like what are we um what do we got going okay well first off just follow me on twitter Mo Dakil, M-O-D-A-K-H-I-L underscore NBA. That's where you'll see all the stuff I do. I put everything I do on there as well as pictures of my little dog. Um, the, uh, the most important stuff. Yeah, just, you know, I mean, everybody wants more of the dog and less of me. Let's just be honest. Yeah. Um, the, Love you, Mo, but the dog, the dog. He, yeah. He's adorable. Um, and, and, you know, go check out Nerder She Wrote. It's basically, you're catching what was the live trade show between me, Dave Dufour, Seth Partnow, uh, Andrew Schlecht, and David Aldridge dropped by for a little bit to, to talk there near the end. Um, you can just check me out on all the Athletic Podcast Network. 
uh, NBA shows. I'm on Basket Buzz Nerd. She wrote Daily Ding. Uh, I do a Twitch stream. I don't know if you know this one there, Sam. I do a Twitch stream uh, Monday through Friday. The schedule time-wise has been changing quite a bit. But I break down NBA games and things like that. It's a lot of fun. And, and just come through there. Just follow me on Twitter. You'll see all my stuff. Oh, and I write for Bleacher Report. Mo's the best. Just go follow him. Go find him. His Twitter handle, for those watching on YouTube, is right there. It's Mo Dekeel underscore NBA. He's fantastic. Please. This, just... this was going on YouTube? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, please go and follow all of the great work over at The Athletic. All of our writers today did such a great job. They, they did an incredible, incredible job covering the trade deadline. I will have something on Ben Simmons. I might have something on Marvin Bagley, just conceptualizing how that could work in Detroit. I'm, you know, going to have something coming up later next week with the draft. I might have another follow-up NBA trade deadline podcast. I might cover it the whole direction. Might do like a cap centric part of the NBA trade deadline thing that Mo and I, we tend to talk more basketball stuff as opposed to cap. I got into it a little bit with the Marvin Bagley stuff, but in the same way, you don't want me to be a reporter. You don't want me doing cap stuff, guys. Let me just tell you, (laughs) I'm like pretty good at it, but like, I need, I need someone like I need an expert. I I, I'm, I'm good enough at it to talk my way through it. I'm good enough to conceptualize it and figure it out in my brain, but it's better when, you know, someone like Danny LaRue, is yeah. there and can talk me through it. So uh, may- maybe keep on the lookout for that. I don't know. We'll see. I might do a cap centric with someone might do, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens here. I don't know. I might just end up doing a, another draft show next week with Matt Penning, but keep it locked here. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Go subscribe everywhere that you can get this show. We will be back later uh, on this week, next week, whenever with more until next time we will talk soon. Bye.